welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else because I love the supernatural realm much more than the stinko temporary realm that most people are in. I'd much rather be in the heavenly realm because that's where I'm going to expend eternity. And most people talk a good game, but they're not there. But I'm there, and you're going to be there if you listen long enough. Demons taught my next guest supernaturally and elevated her to be a top television dancer for the sake of propagating the gospel of the new age, which is contrary to the, and the word gospel means good news, the good news of truth. Why would someone ever want a counterfeit when they could have the real thing? I tell you the answer. They've never seen the real thing. Robin, as a young child, you had reoccurring nightmares. Yes. Oh, tell me about them. Um, well, on um, my my mom's side, it was like it's like a kind of a, a war between good and evil. Now that I know later, but um, on one side of the family, um, uh, there was uh, black witches, satanic witches, mm -hmm. and um, then on the other side of the family, there were spirit-filled believers, and um, you know uh, they believe uh, the the in the black witches believe that you'll be born or one of the generations will be born with what is called the veil, which is basically what people would call a, a supernatural or um, ESP gift. And um, from the time I was little, uh, it, it began to operate in me immediately. Tell me about this dream. I was a little, little, little girl, maybe about four or five. And in the dream, um, this woman would come to me on a horse, and on a white horse, and I'd be, I'd be in this cabin and she had these piercing blue eyes. And I could describe her like I could describe you right now. It was that vivid. And um, they came all the time, all the time and all the time. And I finally, you know, um, I kept telling my mom. My mom got concerned about it. And I remember I was sitting on my mom's bed one day and I said, Mom, I said, you know, who is this person? And, and my mom said, that is my great grandmother. And she said, you are describing her perfectly and um, uh, she was a witch. And uh, you, uh, uh, you were being teased a lot in school. You got into a fight one time with a guy and uh, your parents decided the best <laughs> thing to do with Robin is yeah. to ship her off to her grandparents. Yes. But it didn't turn out too nice. Well, you know, when you have a paranormal um, gift, when you, when, you know, basically, I mean, from the moment that I could talk, I had sensitivities to the psychic realm that were not explainable to people. I couldn't explain them to people, and so I was, I was considered a super sensitive kid, even though I was really smart. And um, my parents, you know, thought for my own safety because um, of all the, the belligerence of the other children. Mm -hmm. They'd send me to my grandparents, um, but when I lived with my grandparents on a ranch, um, I went through a child molestation from, you know, early age of two, three, four, all the way up until I was 13 years old when I ran away. So that also, you know, on top of um, the other situation really opened me up to the, the psychic realm, which is what happens to many women. You know, I, I think that um, the statistics are about 87% of women, you know, that have m murdered somebody or that are in prison or, and, and then you look at the other gamut that are overachievers, have had some type of traumatic sexual experience in their life. Sounds like a high percentage of women, period. Yeah, it's a lot, this. a lot of women, a lot. And, and, and so, in your case, you're traumatized, you don't know what to do about it. But according to your book, uh, you become the overachiever. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I think basically is is Sid. I think that you know you're a victim because you know basically when you're being child molested, 
and then it gets to the point of, of, of going all the way, if you, and I don't want to say this really on television, but um, it gets to that point where you know that you, you could give birth to a, a child. Um, you know, I ran. I ran away. Um, but all during that time period, I would lay still and act like I was asleep. And so you're always having something done to you. And, and um, you know, I became a victim. But to counteract that, you know, um, victim uh, mentality, I became uh, an overachiever. I thought if I could get a 4.0 average, if I could be a cheerleader, or if I could, you know, if I could um, you know, be the best that there is, you know, who's who in, 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 in all this, that people would love me. And, you know, there's, there's a huge confusion between when, when, when someone who is supposed to take care of you, so they're, they're an adult, they're supposed to take care of you, they're supposed to love you, they're supposed to protect you, and then all of a sudden there's this sexual um, um, intrusion on your life. You know, you get messed up. I mean, there's just, uh, there's uh, speak, no... Uh, speaking of messed up, yeah. you know what happened to Robin? She went over uh, on, on, a, on a school trip to uh, England. Yeah. And she got a whole uh, course, if you will, from some experts in witchcraft, the new age, uh, the psychic realm. And when she came back, she bumped into what is called in the Bible a familiar spirit or a demon. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this word. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Robin Harfouche. And uh, Robin, like so many other young women, was uh, messed up. <laughs> we can be messed up in many different ways. She was sexually abused. But she became an overachiever to have control somewhere in her life. She goes off to England. And although she always had these paranormal type of uh, inclinations, it really developed in England. She comes back and a uh, spirit comes to her who identifies itself as Marilyn. And this spirit says that she can become a top dancer. She works hard, but what happened to you was beyond hard work. You had never danced before. No, at a, I mean, a professional dancer has to normally start when they're a child. Um, I started at 18 years old, and I was immediately accepted into American Dance uh, Company, which is a, a large company, uh, goes worldwide. And they brought me in as a character dancer, but then they just started training me across the board. And within probably five years of studying 25 to 40 hours a week, I became a pro. And then my first job was on uh, Solid Gold, which was a, a television show in the 80s. Uh, who were who the stars of that? Um, <laughs> well, um, it was Dionne Warwick to start, and then mm -hmm. Marilyn McCoo took over afterwards. But you should have never gotten that far. But the thing that is so amazing to me is that someone that is very high up in Hollywood had your telephone number. Tell me about that. Sid, I, I have to really be so straightforward with you about this situation. Um, you know, you look nowadays and you see the awesome things that um, famous people are doing. Of course. And I believe their heart is after God. I believe that with all of my heart. and. And, and, and I believe in what they're doing. Um, and this is what this entity or this spirit being um, taught me was that, you know, once I give you a platform and then the manager came into play, he had my phone number on his personal call sheet to call. He didn't know how it got there. We met, it was like this amazing connection. Um, you know, spirituality is not only reserved for Christians, which I think, you know, people like freak out about that. But the bottom line is that, is that I was looking for reality. I was looking for truth. I was looking for not so much power, you know, to have power over people, mm -hmm. but I wanted honesty. I wanted truth. I wanted, I wanted to find God. I was looking for God. This man and I connected on the basis of God. And he said, that God spoke to him 
showed him that my spirit guide was Marilyn Monroe. Really? Who he represented when she was on the West Coast. He was her manager. And um, he basically, from that point on, began to propel me into the forefront of the entertainment industry. And you know, it's a, it's a long process, you know, but, um, but I was right in the middle of it, right in the middle of it. Uh, he worked with Shirley MacLaine? He was, he is Shirley MacLaine's manager still. And then um, before that, when Dean Martin was alive, he was Dean Martin's manager, um, Gene Kelly, uh, he managed Gene Kelly. He managed Michael Jackson for film. What did he want you to do? He wanted me to become a new um, uh, Shirley MacLaine because a I Pied Piper of of uh, channeling of new age. Yeah, and 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 I mean, and that's cool. That's fine. But at the same time, you know, my thing was acting, singing, and dancing. And yes, I had these gifts. Um, but I didn't want the gifts to be the forefront of my life, but he really did. And um, basically the deal was the gifts, you propagate the New Age movement, you know, um, uh, which, you know, when I was told about the New Age movement in, in when I was 18 years old, that word wasn't even a terminology. And so I was taught about this you know, this movement, this New Age movement, when it wasn't even available. And then I would become, like I am talking, talking to you right now about our Messiah, I would become the kind of person that would do good works, that would go on, you know, television shows, that would, would say, look, I know God, you can know God. People would look up to me and then they would want to follow what I do. And that was the plan. Now, he insisted that you learn how to uh, have a spirit go inside of you and yes. talk through yes. you. Yes. Uh, but that turned you off. How come? Well, because you know, there's a there's there's a thing called channeling. Yes. And um, and so what you do is you actually open yourself up and empty yourself of everything, and you allow a spiritual entity to come into you and speak through your mouth. Um, that's a very high level of the New Age movement. And so he wanted me to achieve that level. Um, and uh, when you're in that position, you can prophesy, you know, you can lay hands on people, which is called white light healing. Um, you can, uh, you know, read tarot cards. Um, you can basically uh, look at a person and see if they're sick. You can look into their bodies and see, see places. I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but you can. You can do it. And so that's what he wanted me to do full time, you know, plus the, the whole acting, right, singing, but, dancing but in thing. In your book, you describe what one of these uh, channeling meetings was like. What yeah. did you observe? Well, they sent me to Mill Valley, which is kind of like a hotbed for mm -hmm. the new age. I walked into a room, there were 24 other psychics there, and that's what they called me, a psychic. And um, a woman came in who looked like she'd be like your next door neighbor, mm -hmm. like the pink kind of rollers in her hair and, you know, baked cookies. And she sat down, and when she sat down, um, I got nauseated in my stomach, and all of a sudden I felt paralyzed, like I couldn't move. And she started talking, and out of her, out of this normal looking lady's mouth came this deep guttural male voice but that had a presence on it that literally paralyzed me. So, so. you wanted no part of that and when you told, <laughs> when you told, I don't blame her, I'd want no part of it and when she told her manager uh, all hell broke loose. She was working, uh, is, she had a job as a waitress uh, and a hundred, was it a hundred and fifty pound door yeah, came crashing door. on her yeah. head. Yeah. She'll never dance again. She'll never walk normal again. She is a mess. These demons didn't like that she didn't want anything to do with it. Don't go away. We'll be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Robin Harfush, and uh, Robin was being groomed to be a spokeswoman for the new age in Hollywood. She achieved stardom. She was one of the top uh, dancers on television. 
but she refused to go all the way with the New Age when she saw uh, when someone was channeling, their voice changed, and it, it just was evil and ugly, and she didn't want anything to do with it. And so these demons paid her back. They dropped a 150-pound door upon her. And uh, at, what was wrong with you physically after the door fell? Well, I was in Sonny Bono's restaurant in L.A., and the utility door came off the hinges on the bottom hit me like a hammer. I woke up six weeks later. Six in, weeks later? Six weeks later in Cedar sinai Hospital. And I was strapped down to the bed because I was having seizures every hour. I had morphine in one arm and then they were feeding me intravenously through the other arm. And uh, I had lost, totally paralyzed on my left side, lost the use of my arms and my legs. The motor ability in my brain had been dislocated from the rest of my body. So like if my brain would tell my hand to do something, it just wouldn't do it. You know? Could you dance anymore in the future? No, 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 no. I had 23 doctors and uh, after that, after intensive care, after rehab, after months and months and months of doing everything they could do for me, um, 23 doctors said that you'll be like this the rest of your life. I was 28 years old and in a wheelchair. So you go back home, yeah. you're about ready to, you're depressed, you're about yeah. ready to commit suicide, and the phone rings. What happened? <laughs> well, this wonderful guy who's a Jewish guy who's a, a born-again believer who got um, saved in the tri Presbyterian church. Um, What's a nice Jewish guy doing <laughs> in the Presbyterian church? <laughs> thank God, thank God. And he um, he was a rock and, he was in a rock and roll band. Mm -hmm. And um, so he, he, he called me and he said, will you come to church with me tonight? Now, you know, I'm not the kind of person you ask to go to church, but for some reason, there was something in his voice that hooked me inside my heart and I got really excited. And I didn't know why I'm excited because I, I'm not church. Sure. You know, now I've never been in church. And um, maybe a Catholic cathedral somewhere in Europe or something, but I mean, I'd never been in a church. And um, so it took me three hours to get ready and um, I, that day I decided to take my life. So, you know, it was, it was I'm gonna go to church and then I'm gonna come home and I'm gonna take an overdose of drugs, go to sleep and that's it. Cause I'm not gonna live the rest of my life in this wheelchair. And um, I got to the church and um, they helped me in and I sat down, the power of God uh, hit me, which I know is the power of God now. At the time, I didn't know what was going on. Um, it was like. Did someone lay hands on you? No, I was. Did just, someone pray for you? No, I. I it was when it was when they helped me through the door because I couldn't walk. I'd left my wheelchair at the house. <laughs> Don't ask me why. It was just a crazy well, day. Didn't you have difficulty driving to the church? Well, um, my house was three blocks straight downhill to Hollywood Presbyterian Church. I lived above Gower, right under the Hollywood mm -hmm. sign, so I coasted in my Porsche. You were motivated. <laughs> so, so you're in there and yeah. did you, what, what did you feel? Well, when, when I walked through the door, I felt like you, the lightning bolt hit me and it just hit me from the top of my head and I started. But, but let me ask you something. Uh, if you were crippled, how did you walk through the door? Oh, well, when they saw me, you know, when they saw me trying to grab my way on the car, the people came and helped me Okay. and they got me in. But this heat hit my body like a fire I'd never felt in my life. Then I started sobbing from the inside out like, like you know, like you, I don't know, you hit a gusher, you know? And so I was sitting there and I was crying my eyes out. I'm dripping sweat, you know, I'm shaking really bad. My friend um, never had seen anything like this. And, um, and, uh, and I sat there and I heard the gospel preached. And when they gave the altar call for salvation, they helped me up to the front, and I didn't um, know about Jesus as a healer, but I knew by, by, by the words that they spoke that the God that I had, um, you know, I'd looked my whole life for was Jesus and all of a sudden, all these horrible things that I've been involved in just appeared before my eyes. Like, uh, you saw the spirit guide called Marilyn, which, what the spirit really looked like. What did it look like? Oh my gosh, uh, Sid, just 
like something you'd see in a you know a horror movie. I mean, I don't know where they get these things, but they look just like that. You know, just a creature. You know, with just a huge creature, horrible creature. And um, I was at the front, and the gentleman who'd been in Catherine Coleman's services, he was an usher uh, in the services, but he was ministering that night with my husband, and he just said, you're being healed. And when he didn't touch me, he didn't pray the sinner's prayer with me, and all of a sudden I just flew backwards and hit the ground. And this beautiful woman came up, and put her arms around me. She said, it's okay, baby, you're just being healed. Because it took 45 minutes. I was on the ground screaming, top of my lungs, crying. You know, I didn't know, you know. You went in as an invalid. Did you literally walk out whole? I, when they stood me up, I had, you know, my normal maintenance drug was 14 Percodan a day, six Valium, sleeping pills. When they stood me up, I was straight. You know, and you know, you go from being on drugs all the time to being totally off. It's like huge. Every muscle in my body worked. My legs worked. My arms worked. Everything worked. And um, I just sat down in the front row, and I was just—I was in another world. You know, it was like all the darkness was gone, and and you know, it was like Disneyland. <laughs> you know what's so wonderful? One of the associate ministers there, God speaks to. Robin wasn't married <laughs> at the time, and sh he became her husband. They started a congregation. They had a storybook life, and then a major event happened in their life. She had an encounter in heaven. But right now, there are people that believe in reincarnation. Would you like to know how reincarnation operates? Remember that demon that disguised itself as Marilyn Monroe? Well, that demon was in Marilyn Monroe. And then that demon was in Robin. So Robin would know things that that demon knew about Marilyn Monroe that she had no way of knowing. That's how people come up with this whole idea of reincarnation, but reincarnation and belief in Jesus are mutually exclusive. Why? Because you don't have to keep coming back to get better and work off your sins. Jesus worked off your sins. And the Bible says that when God sees someone that's repented of their sins, made Jesus their Lord, and he lives inside of them and has intimacy with God, he doesn't even see Robin anymore. He doesn't even see me anymore. He doesn't even see you anymore. God sees Jesus, and God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. The Bible says you are the righteousness of God in Messiah Jesus. You can't get any more righteous. Such a deal. You have to be Meshuggah not to want to have intimacy with God. So you may have been bored and turned off religion, but you're not bored and turned off with God. Say, Jesus, I make you Lord. Let's get going on this adventure. <laughs>